On the 16th episode of the American Revely podcast, we use the movie Independence Day as one giant analogy to demonstrate a powerful tool of visualization, all the while taking you down a never-ending rabbit hole of twists, turns, and revelations. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the American Revenue Podcast proudly brings to you the most anticipated podcast episode of 2020, the most in-depth, borderline explosive comparison the world never knew it needed. This is the 16th episode of the American Revelry Podcast, the Independence Day is still relevant edition. So I was planning a Kevin Hart episode about his new book, The Decision. I read that the uh, Sunday before last, and then I saw Hart on Rogue, and I said to myself, you know what? Trailblazers follow their vision, so I'm not going to follow anybody else's. So no cheap clicks for me, boys and girls. That episode went in the Becerra. Becerra means trash in Tagalog and Espanol. See, kiddos, we learn on this show. Anyway, I bet you're asking yourself right about now, what do Bill Pullman, Will Smith, Jeff Goldblum, and Randy Quaid have to do with the American Reveille? Well, this podcast's all about drawing in whatever it takes from any and all resources around us to drive us forward. Look, I didn't have much guidance in my younger days, but what I did have was a memory for movies, and Independence Day was a great teacher for me. So, I know you probably think I'm crazy, but sometimes the best lessons are hidden in plain sight. The entirety of the movie Independence Day can be used as a guide to personal and professional success. Whatever awardy thingy they have one day for podcasting, this one will be up there for something. Even if it's for the podcast episode that gave everyone brain damage, but who knows, maybe it'll help. Anyway, follow along if you dare kiddos and hold on to your butts because this one's gonna take you for the loop-de-loop so we begin off the planet and on the moon the gray and barren landscape lifeless breathless a familiar and conquered landscape with a single plaque this plaque is inscribed with the words here men from the planet earth first set foot upon the moon july 1969 anu domine we come in peace for all mankind we come in peace for all mankind this peace this piece is quickly disturbed as we cut to a shot of the famous footprints on the moon being shaken away into dust as an unknown disturbance causes the everyday, dull, unchanging landscape, the complacent and familiar landscape that seems so secure, so safe. Again, this is the moment everything changes. This marks the beginning. All right, cut back to reality. This is an experiment in visualization, utilizing visuals adapted to a way of thinking as a way to retrain your thought patterns, guys. This is a different way of learning. This helps me, so it's worth telling you. I realized a long time ago that if I was going to be successful, I need to be able to cultivate a mindset counter to that of my cruddy upbringing. And with no actual examples or anyone to really teach me, I unintentionally found guidance in movies, television, and even nonfiction books. And Independence Day really represents what you must do internally to be successful. Wage an all-out intergalactic war within yourself. Look, guys, it's all in this movie. Roland Emmerich made a movie that literally can be adapted to your own life story and use like one giant analogy. It, it, it can be like one reference. And, and Independence Day also really contains the most epic presidential speech ever given in any movie, period. Everyone says to cultivate a positive mindset, but nobody explains what that even means. Positive can be defined in a thousand different ways. You know what I say? I say cultivate the Independence Day mindset and every turn, every obstacle, it becomes a learning opportunity. You flip them into growth and success. So I have a theory that the entire movie and all of its characters can be classified as characteristics of our own brains. Stay with me, guys. This really works. And it's really also very entertaining. So you remember being John Malkovich, the movie? Well, I don't remember it. I just remember people went into some filing cabinet, somehow ended up in this homeboy's brain cavity. Here's the difference. Every single main character from Independence Day is about to climb into a filing cabinet somewhere in Area 51 and end up in your head right now. So hang on to your butts again. Hold your breath. We're going to go deep. 
We cut to the next scene, and this is your brain processing. It's processing the unforeseen obstacles and challenges that approach. The mothership heads towards Earth. SETI in New Mexico picks up a signal which leads to the guy that resembles the rich uncle from Fresh Prince as you journey towards your vision of success. The whirling of gizmos and gadgets, zinging of electronics can be heard humming in the background as a trajectory and distance are calculated, arousing enough confusion to raise questions. SETI sends this data to NASA, who sends the data to the Pentagon, which causes the president, you, to be notified. Oh yeah, told you to hold on to your butts. You were warned. <laughs> our intuition, our gut, our input centers, our brain, whatever you want to call it, transmits messages subconsciously and consciously, and, and you interpret the data as you progress on your path towards freedom. Now, this is for people who are already awake, who are already trying to, to succeed, okay? This movie isn't a starter's kit. It's a map to continued consistency and eventual achievement. So there's no room for instant gratification within the rules of the Independence Day mindset. There's the basic levels of this gigantic analogy, okay? Your desire points you in a direction and calls the president, in this case, that's you, bro, that's you relying on your inputs, personality, your decision-making skills, the control center, the architect, and the matrix. Success is close. It's right around the corner. In fact, in terms Independence Day mindset speak, it's coming from the moon. Could you, could you say that again? What, you need it repeated to you? Yeah, the threat? or the opportunity, depending on your mindset, it approaches. The scenes showing this approach can be compared to your brain reviewing the issue at hand. So cut to your logical self, that little part of you that needs to pull the stick from his or her butt, the stiff that's good at solving problems and bad with people. Cut to Jeff Goldblum, David, and his father, Mr. Levinson, or Judd Hirsch. The dynamic between logic and passion is expressed during their chess game, guys. The emotional side of us is impatient and daring, yet the logical side of us is calculating and cocky. Checkmate, Dad. I have to ride my bicycle to work now because it's economical, yet act douchely nonchalant about everything else. Look, David is our stiff, logical side, and he knows it. And his dad represents the slow change, the balance, the slow growth. He symbolizes that for the entire film. Anyway, riding his bicycle through work while everyone's panicking, David's confronted by Harvey Fierstein. You know exactly who that is. He's the, oh my god, I gotta call my mother guy. He represents your panic in the face of chaos. And while David, not seeming to notice the chaos, remains indicative of our logical side, he's hybrid Mr. Spock in this story. However, the entire point ends up being finding the balance between all the things that make you who you are and, and arranging them in whatever way necessary to overcome and accomplish. That's, that's a big secret to it. So finally accepting the fact that you're stumped, your logical side realizes it needs help. It's almost as if the satellites aren't even there. That's impossible cut to our next character trait. My favorite one, the crazy side, the damaged side, the daredevil, the lost child, the screw up, the unexpected underdog. Introduce Russell Case. Like a flying freight train speeding through the air, out of control and out of his mind, he crop dust the wrong field and like the honey badger, doesn't seem to give a damn. He's been through enough crap, literally, and nobody gets him. No one cares. Just like that little messed up side in all of us. The one that no one would ever understand. That's Russell Case, guys. The one person, the one part of us, nobody expects to do anything good, right, or at all. We cut back to you, your conscious thought, the hub, the brain center, the president is speaking to both the side of you that makes knee-jerk reactions and the side of you that makes ethical decisions, Mr. Nimziki and General Gray. Some of these traits, as we gain more success in life and do more things or face more significant problems, we end up having to get rid of some of them, hint, hint. So, these character traits get defined in live action as you near a point where decisions must be made and outside forces are progressing. These forces being the acceleration of plans and the challenges that may possibly force acceleration. Look, the argument between shooting missiles at the, the BS life throws at us or jumping to DEFCON 3 and whether or not that was the actual order is indicative of these characters and their relationship with the parts of us I mentioned earlier. Our issues accelerate. They split into multiple issues or, or opportunities, if we're looking at it that way. And we must make decisions. They should be entering our atmosphere within the next 25 minutes. 
and we definitely don't want to be caught with our pants down around our ankles, now do we? So an issue, some BS, an opportunity to forge a new path, even a risky situation on our path to greatness rears its ugly head. We witness the threat entering the atmosphere when our gut feeling is triggered. We see the U.S. Navy submarine detect the threat. That's the feeling of uneasiness inside of us, programmed into our DNA after hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. The one that lets us know something is up. Whatever it may be, the commander calls Atlantic Command. Just some other inputs, our senses, sight, smell, sound, all the stuff, all these messages make their way back to the command center. Your brain and the president. You, of course. So before we meet one of the next characters we're introduced to... I want to explain how the rest of this works and how it can be adopted. This movie, from this point forward, if you're practicing visualization, it can guide you through major issues and progressions in your life. I'm going to mess up your cornflakes because I'm literally going to turn the rest of this movie into a giant template. And believe me when I say you can plug in anything to this visualization method and find a mental pathway, a guide, a map towards your vision of success, strategic vines. Shout out to episode five of the American Reveille podcast. So sometimes in life we get bombarded. One thing comes after another and it feels like we're suffocating, like we're weighed down. I have some bad news, folks. Unfortunately, the more we succeed, the more that feeling comes with it. There's no amount of money that can get rid of your problems. I'm sure it's nice to have F you money, but that doesn't mean your problems go away. They just change. They just become different kinds of problems and just as dumb in their own ways too. When we finally try to get a grip on what's going on, it blows up in our face. But if it blows up enough, we eventually learn something and can press the fast forward button. At this point in the movie, we lose a reconnaissance plane. Our brain goes into the essential systems mode. We start dumping non-essential data and focusing all special skills to help develop an emergency plan for how to weather the storm and come out better on the other side. We tell ourselves not to panic, but we still panic anyway, even if it's just inside, as we try to figure out what's up, what's coming at us, and how the hell to get to the next level. Though on the outside, we're stoic, we're calm, we're cool, collected, we're ready for anything, at least trying to be, but on the inside, we might be panicking a little. We start putting two and two together, our logical side, our crazy side, everything that makes the little things that makes you, you. Your spider senses kick in, and you get it, you start to realize that you may be able to carve something out of what's confronting you, be it a path to handling a couple big issues or a path to absolute freedom. Oh, keeping up with me, guys? I'm going to let you absorb that like little sea sponges for just a minute while we go to a short commercial break. We're going to keep rolling in the second half of this episode, and as our plans progress, we call in emergency services. We call in another character, and that character arrives. The other parts of us need to begin to come together to work towards a common goal, a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, if you can't speak of what it could possibly even be, you're most likely unhappy or, at the very least, unfulfilled. We'll check that off the list and take care of a couple other things when we get back, guys. Thanks. James Lane would like to take a moment to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to tune into the show. It's because of great fans like you that we strive to deliver the best quality content one can create as fast as one can fling the pen. With that being said, a good little boy never misses his opportunity to sell himself, and though James would never ask you for your money, he would like to let you know that if you absolutely love this podcast, the writing, the art, its production, anything, please do us the personal favor of liking, sharing, tweeting, texting, and talking about this podcast. James Lane is a father, a husband, a U.S. Navy veteran, and is personally committed to the success of the American Revely podcast. Please email James Lane directly at podcast at AmericanRevely.com or please visit our website at www.AmericanRevely.com. Now, now, let's get back to the, back to the show. show. 
What's up, everybody? We are back and bougie. If I didn't mention it before, Connie represents rationality. Yes, Connie. You know who Connie is. She's like the president's aide or advisor person, uh, who also happens to be David's ex-wife, but don't worry. We'll get into that more. There's a whole math thing behind this thing, too. I'm totally going to screw your mind up at the end. All right, we must evacuate the White House. For a moment, you want to shut down. You don't want to deal with anything. Problems and solutions, opportunities and avenues, they may lead to great things, and, and they go against our greatest primal survival instincts at the same time. Bill Pullman, you, your brain, your consciousness, you're going to have to make a decision. In fact, you make a decision. This is the decision you have to make in any situation that demands attention and could lead to the next rung. Evacuate the feelings and emotions we don't need. Get the Joint Chiefs out of here, but I'm staying in the damn White House. Now, of course, the main characters, the parts of us needed to achieve our vision, they have to stay as we systematically kill off the ones we don't need to get the job done. Game of Thrones style. General Grey asks to stay with the President, ethics prevails. Here's the fun part. When you share your plans, your ideas, your solutions, there's going to be a ton of naysayers, haters, and generally envious people that subconsciously wish they had the testicular fortitude to do whatever it is you're trying to do. Most people don't have the damn spine to even solve basic problems, and then you threaten their security by actually trying it all. I use the general panicking of the public in the movie to represent these people. When the president says activate the emergency broadcast system, will advise people the best course of action is to stay in their homes? That's you telling people your plans and the chaotic public represents their shooting down of your ideas, visions, dreams, and goals. The brain starts to gather its resources, calls upon the needed mental armaments. David, logic, recognizes his ex-wife Connie, indicative of rationality on the screen, and begins to put two and two together. Meanwhile, your crazy side starts catching wind of what's happening and has a pretty good idea of what's going on. Russ, getting bullied by the local town folk find some justification in his existence as a problem rears its ugly head and unbeknownst to Russ, his unknown destiny awaits. Everything that makes you who you are and what you are begin to slowly coordinate. They begin to collect and utilize the data. They begin to analyze and create pathways. We're basically meat monkey calculators, guys. Aha, there's an issue, though. Your brain knows that you can't get past all the roadblocks, all the red tape, and all the hardship it takes to truly win the day without courage and risk. Enter Vivica A. Fox and Will Smith. All right, look, guys, I'm doing the best I can with what I've got, all right? And loving ain't what I got. What I got's a little bit out there, all right? But it works. So we get some rumblings, a possible earthquake, nah? We'll go back to bed. All the while, the opportunity approaches and we begin to find out what everybody's made of. We make the conscious decision to take on the endeavor and move onward and upward in this world, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. As our senses, our feelings, they align as our logic, rationality, ethics, and others begin to crucially aid us in the development of a strategy, a clearer vision comes forth from the haze. Slow to the game and taking a leak, our courage, Will Smith, mentions the quakes two or three more times in short sequence, which to me is the only annoying part of the movie, though fortunately it makes perfect sense here. The quake, that's our intuition, a different type of gut feeling, so it fits for now. Anyway, we're shooting aliens as we pick up the paper and recognize the issue as well. Our courage and riskiness, they have something to say, a part to play. It's time to report to El Toro. Vivica, she can come later. We don't need risk yet, and she still has a shift to work tonight. So I want you to think of the journey that these characters from Independence Day take. We're all using them to represent parts of our personality, correct? Well, the next parts of the movie show the characters played by Bill Pullman, Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith, and many others representing our collective consciousness, our logic, our courage, all of that stuff embarking on a journey together. This journey will ultimately lead them to, to finding each other, cutting the fat, and building a perfect winning team. Finding cohesion within ourselves is paramount to overcoming any great odds and achieving anything out of reach. 
any form of greatness whatsoever. Logic calls rationality and warns her of the signal, the code, the key to achieving whatever it is that needs achieving. Rationality cannot justify acting upon logic. It's just too far out there. And at the same time, courage keeps the risk at bay and lets her know things will be all right. And Will Smith, Lieutenant Stephen Hiller, he makes his way to El Toro to begin making moves. Judd Hirsch has to drive David to the White House. And uh, there's all kinds of things that could be said about that. We cut to Russell Case getting arrested for spreading leaflets about the alien spaceships. We usually get some crazy ideas that we lock away somewhere in the deep, dark recesses of our brain, and we just say we don't need these yet. Mm, anyway, from here we see Steve in the locker room at El Toro getting his uniform on. Here we meet Jimmy, a pilot on Steve's squadron, and Jimmy represents wonder and excitement over what could be after the accomplishment of the mission, and of course, Jasmine, Vivica A. Fox, representing Risk. She She's a stripper. Also, Tiffany, the dumb friend of Jasmine, she has no part in this. Next. So now things get weird. The process of grouping the characters together. The first group meeting at the White House, then that group departing and meeting with the rest of the characters group at Area 51. This represents the journey we must take, however long, to find a working path um, with Area 51 really representing whatever outside of the box path is needed to get there. We combine these different parts of ourselves in different ways and attack the opportunities head on. And there's actually a funny back and and forth between Connie, Julius, and David, where it's revealed that David punched the president. And if the president is considered to be you in this analogy, you can actually consider that logic bruising your ego by revealing the truth to you about what actually happened, as, as we sometimes tend to exaggerate things in our own brain. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds right. Anyway, Welcome Wagon explodes and we encounter some failures. Realizing what's happening, we abandon the White House and we make our moves as best we can towards the goal we're trying to achieve, and quite possibly, we fail. The point is surviving the evacuation, learning from our failures and paving the way for a counterattack. We make a major go at something big. We put our emotions into it and President Whitmore's wife is on the helicopter. It's so close. You can almost touch it. It's terrifying. Achieving greatness often is. It's so close and time's up. The signal dissipates. Our dreams, our goals, they explode in our face. Getting away in the nick of time, Air Force One is on the move. Meanwhile, this failure is so explosive that the only way forward is to ignore the naysayers and go with your choice to quit forever or to move forward back into the fray. Achieving something, anything at all, it's not easy. It's all about trial and error, learning, achieving, redoing, learning, achieving, and scaling. The destruction of the cities symbolizes significant failure in your life. The naysayers and envious people, we ignore them from now on. We don't pay attention. We've learned something. We've grown. The civilians are vaporized by the blue beam that comes from the sky. The downing of the helicopters and the beam of destruction teaches us that moving forward, we must do our best to control our emotions and listen to our gut, not what other people think. It was a risky maneuver, but risk lives to fight another day. Back on Air Force One, Bill Pullman reflects upon the devastation left by the alien beam of death and dismay. He beats himself up for his decisions, for his failures. His wife is missing. He's distraught. He's lost. And if you've ever achieved anything in life, you'd be familiar with what I just said, as it represents the reflections and grieving necessary to rebuild yourself and come back stronger for round two, three, four and five and six. And if you don't sit down and go over what you've learned so you can better absorb it, if you just sit around and sulk, you'll just wither away into entropy. It's time for the counterattack. We attack our goals full force, this time having learned from failures in pursuit, the black knight Knights are given the order to fire at will. Attacking the issue at hand head on, once again we fire missile upon missile into the hull of the alien spacecraft, but to no avail. There seems to be a shield protecting it from damage. The ship deploys a bunch of little mini spaceship bad guys, and the fight is on. Going further than you've ever gone before, you're beaten down again and again. We lose most of the Black Knights, including Jimmy, who just couldn't bank at that speed. By this time, you're seasoned. You don't need that wonder and awe anymore anyway. You're grinding towards victory, not fanboy 
going out. Jimmy dies and we learn to not only be focused by the task at hand, but also that we just can't bank at that speed. As Will Smith, our courage makes his escape successfully downing a small alien spacecraft, he takes an alien hostage and with a punch to the face, the lighting of a cigar and a now that's what I call a close encounter. The only close encounter here is what this scene symbolizes. This scene can be used to symbolize the gaining of knowledge from a failure, the secret knowledge that no one tells you that allows you to get back to where you started from and beyond much faster than you ever did before because you've just so happened to have done it once already. The Phoenix Formula, the constant death of old ways and the rebirth from ashes that bring us to new heights every time we learn something of value. Will Smith's kidnapping an alien is indicative of us acquiring knowledge that allows us to skip steps and achieve success on an escalated timeline. El Toro is completely destroyed, but that doesn't mean we can't rebuild. So some of the parts of you that are needed are taking a little longer to meet up with the command center. Risk is lost among the ruins. Our emotions are lying around somewhere helicopter wreckage, our crazy side is fleeing in a caravan, and everyone else is an Air Force One, including both ethics and knee-jerk reactions. Logic steps in, the arguments begin, David's dad, remember, representing slow growth and change, Julius Levinson, he's the tiebreaker. The time brings clarity, and the bickering amongst these people is representative of inner conflict and, uh, indecision. Everyone begins their journey to the final destination, Area 51, an outside of the box solution. So remember, we're using this movie to visualize the path to achieving whatever it is we're setting out to achieve. In real life, this process can take a very long time. It can take years. Will Smith and the alien body, they arrive at Area 51 and Captain Stephen Hiller, along with everyone else, meet up and make acquaintance. All of your failures and experience, they lead you to your final stand in terms of great achievements you need to break through you've tried so many times you abandon complaining you take ownership you begin to synchronize your differing character traits and personality traits and you use them with lethality but unfortunately the pieces are just not together yet you go down an elevator, deeper and deeper into the base, into the vault, into the freak show. You get a plain view. You walk into the room as a heavy metal door splits apart at the seams, making a futuristic hydraulic hissing sound. Walking upon clackering grates, Dr. Oaken, timidness, reveals nervously the three alien bodies suspended in a preservative chemical. Large, black, almond-shaped eyes and biomechanical clawed and wretched suits are horrifying to the layperson. But this is just the breakthrough that a seasoned professional at life needs. Witnessing the enemy up close and personal allows for a fair assessment of weakness. Those three aliens, the ones in the basement at Area 51 and ID4, well, you're going to have to wait until next week to find out what they mean and what the heck's going on. That's right. There's no way to do this in one episode, guys. Independence Day is like a three-hour movie. So before we end the show, I would like to talk about a few things. First, last week I did an episode on George Floyd, and it was highly emotion-driven. However, I believe I made some extremely valid points. But unfortunately, it turns out that some people are also misconstruing one thing for another for personal benefit. And I feel at this point, it's best for me to just step out of that arena and leave it to more qualified individuals. We're going to continue our brand of content and do the best we can not to let it be influenced by emotion or knee jerk reactions. All right. So now I need to ask a huge favor of you guys. And I haven't asked directly before, but I need you guys to rate and review my podcast on whatever platform it is you listen to. It really helps me improve and grow the show and also get some attention and move up the rankings a little bit. I need you guys to start following me on social media a little bit more as I would really like to interact with more people, develop some friends of the show and really build this great community. I also need you guys to check me out on YouTube and subscribe. Just search for the American Revely podcast and you'll find me on everything and anything. Please get on and tell me what you like about the show and what you don't like and what could use some work. I'm counting on you guys to talk to me so that we can build this thing together and I'm thankful for every single person who's given me feedback thus far and every single person listening. So in the midst of all this uncertainty and in preparation for next Monday's episode, it's time to sit down and rewatch one of the greatest sci-fi and self-improvement movies ever made, Independence Day. So guys, brace yourself for shock, ladies and gentlemen. Brace yourself for shock. Next week, 
is part two. And unlike the actual sequel to Independence Day, this one's not going to suck at all. So I want to thank you so much for listening to the American Reveille podcast. And please, like I said before, please don't forget to review, like, subscribe, comment, do it all, every position. We'll see you next week, folks. This is James Lane, and I'm clocking out.